with Kike started with a lonely voice on radio with contents that broke the radio waves. I can actually testify today. <laughs> Second of February, the maiden edition of Real Talk with Kike, live on television, captured the screen of the viewers. We are on Real Talk here and I must say it as it is. Ever since, Real Talk with Kike has been growing in leaps and bounds. The highlights are not the great news and discussions that have been taken, but the consistency and growth achieved over time. You can count on Real Talk with Kike to bring you. Women, politics, governance, leadership, youth, moral values, human relations, economic sectors, business, career development, the family circle, children, finance, education, security, and diaspora relations, to mention a few out of the vast areas Real Talk with Kike has covered over the last two years on radio and nine months of being live on television. Who does Amosepo report to? Real Talk with Kike is live on Inspiration FM every Wednesday at 5 p.m. and 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. every Tuesdays and Thursdays live on Silver Burst Television. Television. It is a live show dissecting contemporary issues with live interviews and unbelievable giveaways on air till date. The show features hot button and topical issues and six answers to what, how, and why of raging matters of the day. The show has interviewed social figures, industry icons, statesmen, business greats, celebrities, politicians, and many times everyday people doing extraordinary things to capture the essence of stakeholder reach. Congratulations, Real Talk with Kike on second anniversary. Right, excellent afternoon viewers. This episode supports the saying that says health is wealth. Those who are not down by one illness or the other do not value the soundness of their health. Or will I say that those who are not down on the sick bed do not, um, I would like to sometimes wish they can exchange the riches to the soundness of their health. Again, I say welcome to another interesting episode of Real Talk with Kike. I remain your convener, Kike Lomat on that one. And of course, I'm with the Real Talkers. Let me start with the man with the envelope shirt. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm unbroken. I'm unbroken. Envelope <laughs> shirt is very nice. Very unbroken. Very unbroken. You can't even be broken. You're yeah. too solid to be broken. Shake your hand. You're unshakable. <laughs> that was the first thing I said. I said, your shirt is very nice. Envelope. Sweet. Envelope. Uh -huh. I'm enveloped by the love we give to our audience, our viewers at home. Welcome to the Real Talk with Kika show, the RTWK show, as I like to call it. My name is Marshall Anthony Ononye. I'll hand over the button to Dab. My name is Dab Lola Banure. From everywhere you're having the privilege, it's a rare privilege and opportunity to still be alive today. And we thank God for his message thus far. Please sit with us. Enjoy the ride. We're going to give it to you precise and real. All right, today's, today is November 16th, uh, November 16th of 2021. Let's see what happened in the past on this day in history segment. Please stay with us, we'll be right back. On this day in history, November 16, 1960, Inamdi Benjamin Azikwe was born on November 16, 1904, was appointed as Governor General of the Federation of Nigeria. Azikwe became active in the Nigerian Youth Movement, NYM, the country's first nationalist organization, although he supported Samuel Akinsaya as the NYM candidate for vacant seat in the Legislative Council in 1941. The NYM Executive Council selected Ernest Ikuli. Azikiwe resigned from the NYM, accusing the majority Yoruba leadership of discriminating against the Ijebu Yoruba members and Igbos. Some Ijebu members followed him, splitting the movement along ethnic lines. He entered politics, co-founded the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, NCNC, with Herbert Macaulay in 1944. Azikiwe became the Council Secretary General in 1946. Azikiwe died aged 91 on the 11th of May, 1996, at the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital in Enugu after a long illness and is buried in his native Onitsha. His picture appears on Nigeria's 500 Naira banknote since 2001.
All right, on this day in history segment, we all agree that you know the 500 naira note having its picture on it since beautiful. 2001 is the most beautiful thing that we can see today, 16th of November, when yeah. it comes to on this day in history. Yeah. And the fact that you know it fought for the Yoruba people, you know what, it's something that I actually also admire yeah. about him when it comes to the Nigerian um, youth movement as well. And with what is happening around us, especially with the report of NSAS, you know, I think the Nigerian youth movement needs to be pushed forward more so that the youth can have some inclusion yeah. in the governments yeah. that we have presently because sure. I feel that they are angry. Uh, but before I keep going on, I know you guys should stay tuned for our um, trending stories. Masha, what's your take on this day in history? Well, um, I'm just thinking, I'm liking the look of Namdi Azeku on 500 Naira, beautiful, and the fact that this man left his political party um, finding the cause that will seem more liberal than selfish. The person whom he was agitated against was his own native brother. Oh. You know, and then he was promoting, he was doing that agitation against the discrimination of a Yoruba man. That's, that really caught my attention. It was interesting. Okay. I'll, say, uh, I'll really say I share your Zoom. thoughts too because having an Igbo man resign from a juicy position before, before the sake of a Yoruba man. For the sake of it, and look at what we have now. Igbos are fighting differently. Yorubas are fighting differently. The Aousas are there's so much division yeah. already, which is not supposed to be. I'll take a clue from even the recent, um, um, I think the Attorney General of Ogo State that resigned due to corruption. I think our leaders should learn to make a reservation of resignation when you feel that the cost is no longer going according to what you believe in. Resign and have peace. <laughs> the labors of our heroes past shall not be in vain. All right, on the show today, we are talking about the L challenge that has, you know, claimed more than, um, more lives than the coronavirus, HIV AIDS. It is a disease peculiar to Africa. And of course, when it comes to tropical um, re, uh, rainforest uh, regions of the world, for a disease that accounts yearly for the, for the death of a, uh, a, a apology, of a fever that claimed over 260,000 children under the age of five. Malaria is a terrible um, scourge. Um, I must say that needs more attention when it comes to uh, after COVID-19 pandemic. To speak more about this topic, we have a renowned, uh, a renowned um, apologies, a renowned doctor with over 30 years of experience. They will be joining us shortly to speak on the malaria epidemic and of course the Nobel malaria vaccine and the implication of for humanity, particularly um, Africans. Before then, let's get a quick look at our profile. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, um, Dr. Tugi, many thanks for creating time to be here today. Of course, uh, seeing you guys, you know, let, let me first of all welcome the other um, um, doctor that is joining us via Zoom. Um, are you there? 
Yeah, fantastic. It's good to have you on the show. Of course, I must say that, you know, most times when you are with the doctors themselves, it looks as if your mind, you know, you feel better, even in as much as we all have a lot going on in our heads, in our personal <laughs> lives. Well, uh, I must say that thank you so much for being here physically and of course uh, for also joining us via the Zoom line. How are you guys doing today? Let me start with you, Dr. Tuye. Uh, I'm not on strike again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not working. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing fine. I'm trying yes. to be good. A lot of things goes on your head. Thank you for that slide. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know if the other doctor can hear us. Can, are you there? I can hear you. Oh, oh okay, fantastic, great. fantastic. Many and thanks again, Dr. Olufela um, Uri Dota. I hope I pronounced that properly. That's oh, all right. Many okay, thanks Olufela for... You are going to be part of the people who are going to be finding solutions to a lot of challenges that we are facing globally today. But I think, you know what, you know, Coming to you first, because I know that there are quite a number of things that is going on presently, but I must ask you, because I know that um, this is like a breakthrough, b basically. And um, I don't know if I should say that um, there are a lot of things happening, especially when it comes to... Um, let me let you go. I'm, I'm being okay, now, first that. of all, I, I think that um, this vaccine that has been found or that has been put together to work for malaria... Are we sure that it will last us I, a I lifetime? Think, I think that we, let, let, let's start from the point of him telling us about the vaccine and the breakthrough. Let's have an overview so we okay. don't lose our viewers there. Tell us about this groundbreaking history that's been made. Well, um, thank you. Malaria for mm -hmm. thousands of years has been killing people. And presently, we find that malaria, um, about 3.2 billion exposed to the infection, more than 20 million infection every year culminating in 500,000 about 500,000 deaths majority of those deaths in sub-saharan africa 260,000 of that in under five um, with malaria um, we're losing as much as 12 billion every year um, in africa and our gdp is contracting by as much as 1.3 percent now if you see a disease that is killing that number of younger ones mm -hmm. children and hitting your economy uh, seriously, it behoves you to actually find a permanent solution to it. Uh, this is the first time we're seeing a vaccine being raised against a parasite. Most of the vaccines you see are either against bacteria or viruses. But this is the first time we're seeing vaccines against being raised against a parasite. parasite. And then, more than 30 years, Glatus McLean, um, SKB, Glatus McLean, GSK. Uh, mm. yeah, sorry, GSK, GSK. Glatus McLean now. Um, in conjunction with the Vas Gavi Global Alliance of Vaccine Initiative, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and um, uh, this, uh, this uh, fund, Fund for Tuberculosis and Co., now push forward this vaccine. Now we're able to test this vaccine in as much as 2.3 million people in Malawi, Kenya, and Ghana. And we now find it very safe. Um, 2.3 million doses administered so far. Mm -hmm very safe and what we are getting is that we are achieving 30 percent reduction okay. in severe malaria okay uh, is the severe form of the malaria that's our problem you know in the severe malaria um what you want to ask the question that ah, 30 percent why should that be an excitement but let's face it because you know we've been battling malaria for a long time it used to be malaria control rollback malaria uh, malaria uh, eradication, eradication now we're pushing for elimination of malaria. So we're, it, it's, a, it's a portfolio of a lot of activities okay. to deal with malaria. Okay, okay. okay so uh, if I hear thanks you. for that. In a, you know, let me come to Dr. Lufela. You know, I know that with what you have shared thus far, I must ask you, do you think that this, um, what was accelerated by the speed in finding a vaccine to COVID-19, is part of the fact that the lessons of COVID, uh, of coronavirus pandemic taught us that we have to give timelines to finding solutions to what uh, biotech, uh, biotech um, industry gives when it comes to, because I know that exactly 18 months was uh, what was given to find a vaccine for COVID-19. Do you think that the same thing happened to the malaria epidemic? Uh, ma malaria, thank you, Kike, for having me on your program. Malaria is not really an epidemic. Okay. 
is an endemic problem in our country. Okay. So, and it kills a lot of people, like my colleague said. A lot of our children and women die every year because of malaria, about 100,000 of them, at least. So I agree with him completely. We, we may say 30% reduction was the excitement. Of course, there are challenges even with the vaccine that we are talking about, but the malaria vaccine, they've been, we've been trying to produce it for so many years. It's not in the last two years. Uh, the European uh, Medicine uh, Authority actually approved it since um, 2014. So it's not, it's not something new. And we've been trying to experiment with it before we get to this level. To answer your first question, you ask whether it's going to confer life immunity. Immunity, no. In fact, after some years without the booster, the protection that that person will offer after three doses, after about four years, without a booster, may be close to zero. You know, but there is still excitement because despite the bed nets, all the other measures that I want people to do, the environmental measures, the measures that we use to control vectors, the bed nets, all, and some countries are actually achieving that zero malaria reporting. And they were getting that certification. But when we look at Africa, especially Nigeria, that is contributing about a quarter of the whole problem, of the whole burden in the world, then it's an excitement. At least, at least some children will be saved. Some children will be saved. Uh, I, think, I think I will stop there because WHO also realized, although there are some challenges that we will look at later, but they also realize that um, the, the country where they tested the, the vaccine, that the non-vaccine intervention, the other public health intervention, that the, those people did not relax concerning it. And it's a, that's a very good welcome, uh, welcome development. But that does not mean it will translate to reality, to practical realities. When it gets to our country, looking at our peculiarity, our peculiarities, our diversities. So we, we, we still have to do All more right. research concerning it. So let me stop. All right, uh, Dr. Lufela, many thanks for that. You said you were going to yeah. stop there. I don't think you will stop there. Apologies, Dami, before you take a swipe at him. You know, because what you were saying earlier, but one of the questions that I, I picked from your submission is the fact that children under the age of five, I think five years of age, uh, to be precise, are the most vulnerable group affected when it comes to malaria. And in 2019, Correct. they have, uh, you know, accounted for, I think, over 6,000 um, 6, um, children of all malaria death in worldwide so i must ask you with what you shared us with especially when it comes to who what you know what does uh, the vaccine you know indicate for the future of the children given the number of innocent lives that have been affected or that have been lost to malaria there, there are there are prospects the, the most queries the vaccine we are talking about is the first one there are other vaccines that have more potency, that have shown more better efficacy, close to 75%. In fact, there is one of them that's about 77%. But we need to, to do more research concerning them. But when we get those vaccines, it will help us. So many of these measures, we give people net free. Our environment, look at it, is dirty. The breathing space for malaria is there. The stagnant water is there. The bushy place is there. The drugs, people will not even go to hospital early until those children start convulsing, start having problems. And there are issues with pregnant women also. Pregnant women are at risk. There are challenges concerning them. They are, not even, they are already malnourished before they even have the pregnancy and they have malaria with it. So the, the, the prospect is high, but we should not relent on the other measures that we have. And I hope with this, we should be able to control malaria to some, to some extent. Thank you very much. But I'm coming to Dr. Tui. What is the position of our research centers in Nigeria? Well, um, again, um, if you want to do research, 
two things, two critical things are very important. You need money, you need human resources, um, and you, if you are the third in the right technology. Now, um, if you look at our budget for health, it cannot even vaccinate the children. We have to wait for partners to be able to vaccinate. Or else the budget is mainly recurrent, you know, nothing, no new things is happening. And if you look at the budget for research, it's actually quite infinitesimal, virtually non-existent. And then you write, okay, now we, we, we expect the universities and research institutions to actually, you know, lead the fray in terms of budgeting. But uh, strike every day now, and they're not being paid. There's no equipment. There's no distance. So when we talk about research, we're not just there. Uh, what could happen is to see the drive of the, of the public-private partnership to see that, okay, uh, how do we link research to industry? How do we link research to in innovations to industry? Um, Biotech is a big, big money spinning venture that in such a way that um, I can push for a research even in developing the, there are still many more vaccines to be developed. It takes time, you know, people spend money. If you remember the COVID vaccine that everybody's talking about, it was a lot of money put in. Even US government put just $4 billion, a lot of money, apart from other countries. So if you put the money and you put the human resources, you will get your breakthrough. But unfortunately for us, we're so poor in quotes that considering health intervention is a huge, it's a huge, it's a huge uh, limit. Um, so we're not just there. But, and if you look at the whole of the budget of Nigeria as it is, it may not be up, be up to the budget of maybe Harvard University, for instance. I can tell you authoritatively. It's not up to the budget of Harvard University. So when we're talking about, um, and then what could save Nigeria is that thinking gap. What is going on between our ears in terms of how to mobilize money, mobilize human resources, and to deliver the envisioned health that we're looking for? Well, I, I think it's, it's for you, the experts that are in the field, if you're not. Um, if you're not reading on the lapses, on the inefficiency of governance, if you, the professionals, the doctors the, that are in the uh, field, the battlefield, if you're not reading from the inefficiency and the uh, lacuna created by the government in ensuring that the right uh, uh, channels are plugged, like for instance, key into Dami's question, we here have 30 years of research, 30 years of experimentation, laboratory work done, and then here uh, we, we've been handed over the malaria vaccine. We are the ones who are in need of this thing. We are the ones so who the have ones the, we are the ones who have so, the, so the trouble. Yeah. We are the ones who should so go true. to the lab and get this thing done. Uh, so how, 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 how is, what is the guarantee that after this you said booster. After this first one, then the booster. We're not going to go hand in cap to another government to say, give us booster. Um, well, you know, wait. You see, the ultimate aim is to eliminate and subsequently eradicate. Now, let's, uh, this vaccine is an, it's a, one of the tools, one of the key tools that will help us to eliminate mm -hmm. while moving to eradication. Mm -hmm. When we get to eradication, you may not need those vaccines. Yes, but again, there are a lot of diseases, what we call diseases of the poor, the developing countries that have just been neglected. Correlated. So that have been neglected that we need a lot of research on. So um, for us now, it, it's just that a new thinking that will find a way to innovatively fund health research. Um, the other time, um, I, I saw the minister of uh, housing or so mm -hmm. who was who was being a chairman of one fund. Okay, we need more of that to focus on specific diseases. You know, um, and then we need to be able to mobilize the private sectors into contributing some uh, into some of these things, um, and then we can also do what we call twinning. Um, I, I I I I studied abroad, you know, again yeah. where I I am, you know, really sincerely appreciate the depth of research, you know, it's going on done. there. So, but if I tell them that listen, we're doing this, they've known me, they've seen the kind of work I can do, they will actually twin with Correct. us. And then help us to develop. The people are looking for how to. But again, when they look at you generally, they are not serious. You are fighting over pecuniarity in every time. But salary is not. And they wouldn't want to cry more than they, to be Why would they want to get into that system? So if we structure our system very well, I went to University of Ife as first degree, where I saw people Indians in my class. There were four Indians, three wow. ladies and one guy. Oh, two two guys and two ladies. South Africans were in my class. Zimbabwe were in my class. Studying medicine in effect. 
So, and then quite a lot of them went abroad. And they're doing great. This guy, Rajiv, is doing very well in, in, abroad. The guy that operated on guy or one lived abroad, that was my classmate. So I went to school when school was very interesting. Valuable. Very interesting. How do we get back to that stage? You can only get back to that stage when you insist, for instance, that leadership must put their children in this school and let them, they can't run anywhere. Put your children in this school. Let's see how the school runs. If we're not serious about education, what can we be serious about? Education determines a lot of things, your health, your politics, your institutions. It governs and everybody. Even your head, what you think. If we don't, if we're not thinking about that, then what are we going to think about? All right. So, mm -hmm. All right, many thanks for that. I think I want to quickly clear uh, what I said earlier that the most vulnerable group affected by malaria since 2019 has been accounted as 67%. Uh, that is over 260,000. Yes. 260,000. Yes. I, I had that. Yeah. I had so, that. I wanted to clarify that because yeah, I was just you. thinking again thank what you. I said. I yeah, just, over 270,000 yes. malaria deaths worldwide. Yeah, so, yeah. moving on, um, let me come to you, Dr. Olufela, again because I know that earlier you were talking about some countries um, that has been affected so much. And I know that there's an ongoing pilot program in Ghana and also in Kenya, in Malawi, that has reached uh, more than 800,000 children since 2019, to be precise. You know, so I must ask you, what's your observation on the pilot program? What were the scores, you know, uh, that should be received when it comes to WHO um, scorecard before WHO actually appeared on the program? Thank you. Mm. When WHO advise on a program, they will have looked at so many things. But their recommendation are advisory a lot of time. The countries can look at their local peculiarities. One of the reasons why many of the pilots or the, or the experiments were not done in Nigeria, Nigeria has well-structured um, uh, programs when it comes to research. If you remember the Pfizer problem, there was a problem with the north in the north when they had a kind of uh, trial, and then Nigeria they have to go to court and some other. But Nigeria have very strict uh, ethical review in that sense, so it may not be easy because a lot of questions will be will be asked. But that's for that's for another time to to discuss. That might have been. And then they may have some other structure in those countries that they want to leverage on. Uh, WHO, yes, the advice has always been reliable because it's based on scientific facts. The issue about our scientists, our scientists are sound. They are top-notch, really. We have world-class scientists. We don't have, the problem is not with the scientists. Even if we don't have the skill to take it to the to the world class level. The, the, the expertise we have just need a few weeks, two, three months, or some time to familiarize themselves with the latest technology and they will be able to do it. We have top class scientists, and our scientists are not really sleeping. But you see, there are problems in our environment, and you cannot separate the health sector from it. There are issues of poverty. There are issues of ignorance. There are issues of illiteracy. There are issues of weak structures, weak system. There are problems with political will because politics drive everything. You know, nothing is free. Somebody somewhere have to pay for it. That was the time we were producing vaccine in this country. In the 70s, we produced vaccine. So there is no big deal about it. It's just the will. There was a time when Health was free, free health services. There was a time when free education was there. So it's just the will, the political will. Once we get many of these things right, things will go in the right direction. But you cannot separate the health sector from the problems that we have generally in the country because politics actually drive everything. For that, we'll go on a quick break. Glad to know you are still right there with us. In case you just joined the show, today's conversation is about the malaria vaccine. The WHO approved of it last month after successful trials in Kenya, Ghana, 
Malawi and I think with over 800,000 children and we are here discussing with our renowned public health experts that is Dr. Olufela Ogidotsa and, and Dr. Tui on the show talking about the vaccine um, potent for the health sector and the African children and African countries uh, in general. But you know, you can be part of this conversation by calling our studio number 0988 showing on your screen right now. And remember that we're streaming live on Silverbird um, YouTube page and of course on Real Talk with your YouTube page and you can be part of this conversation. So let me co come to you, um, Dr. Tui, because I, I want to go into the, you know, would I say the, uh, this, how would I put it now? I think the, uh, the pharmacy, you know, yes, you know because I, I, yeah, because I know that in that world, there are a lot of things that is happening currently, especially when it comes to uh, constantly being, uh, having, having an uh, active production when it comes to malaria uh, drugs. I think that they've done wonderfully well when it comes to that. So I must say, you know, kudos to them with what they've done thus far, especially with the scientific advancements that have led to uh, led to survival. Uh, survival of several uh, victims, so to speak. So, in your own words, how does um, the vaccine, how has it changed uh, the game for the, how I put it now, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical um, companies thus far, especially tailoring it down to Nigeria, which is part of our own uh, uh, peculiarities when it comes to our environmental challenges? Now, if you look at the evolution of the drugs for, to treat malaria, we used to be quinine, chloroquine, yeah, before we come, we got to these uh, ACTs, uh, Artemisinin Cognitive Therapy. Therapy. Okay, now um, we've achieved quite a lot of success in that trajectory. You know, um, we got to a point where we have a lot of resistance to the chloroquine, and then yeah, quinine became toxic and cannot be commonly used. used. We have to, well, we have to measure. And all of that. Uh, okay, um, and then we have ACT that looks like a wonder drug, you know, in a way. But even that now, we're having resistance to the combination therapy. So the, we don't know when the, the resistance, will, where we're going to get when limits. It's going to come up when it's going to, we don't know when the resistance is going to come up again because for the, vi for the parasite, it keeps you know, changing its forms and shapes in a, in a funny way. So if for pharmaceutical company, there's not going to be an end or a stop to the research to bring out better drugs to, to deal with malaria. <coughs> And then, like we said, this is one of the kitty, one of, the, um, one of the, the means of actually dealing with malaria, especially among the, the targeted age group on the five, five below. you know, below, you know, that usually suffer the severe form of the malaria. So, both the vaccine is just like saying that, you know, before, because we have vaccine for pneumococcus meningitis, that then does it affect the treatment of meningitis? Um, let us be mindful of the fact that if you take vaccine, it doesn't mean that you, you won't pick the disease. You may not pick the severe form, form of, it, of that okay. disease. Okay. And then again, so there's still that space for that research in pharmaceutical on how to deploy the next uh, molecule. Okay. But unfortunately, um, as more countries, more than 100 countries, I think about 20 now, they've actually eliminated malaria in their domain. They've gone to totally zero, zero transmission, including okay. funding small countries, you know, like UAE, you know, Uzbekistan, you know, uh, and, and those tiny countries, mm -hmm. you know, um, Sri Lanka, you know, Iran. They've eradicated. That's, you know, they've taken the zero transmission. But what's now, what's happening to us that we can't eliminate this thing? So now we're having another two. Um, like Dr. Ridot has said, uh, the, the will is key. If you have the political will, it's like, listen, guys, how do I deal with malaria in this community? We have all the tools ready now. Vaccine is being added to it. We have a essential treated net. We have indoor residual spraying. We have the environmental control as it is. We have the therapeutic quick diagnosis and admission of drugs to ensure that, you know, we have vector control. We have a lot of things on our hands, but are we deploying them? Are we using, for instance, the local government to drive mm. clean gutter and all those things and deal with stagnant water? So I don't see the peculiarity, but again, we tend to appear as if there's peculiarity about our whole situation. But like he said, it's about will. So pharmaceutical companies will still have their many things to do as far as malaria is concerned, at least for some time, especially in Nigeria. Okay, um, Dr. Phil, um, Dr. Tui, I would want to look at the correlation between the conventional malaria drugs and the medical 
kind of drug because I know that at least sometimes when you visit the hospital and they ask you to try alternative therapy mm. in court. Is that true? Sometimes when you visit well, the hospital. I, I, I had worked with the, before I left, I worked with Lagos State Government for about 21 years before I left the service, okay? Um, you hear all this kind of story, but you see, what usually happens is this. Um, parents, they look at you, they are expecting a miracle, the, the shortcuts. Um, and when they wait on that, nothing is there. It's not doctors it's that not will, doctors. will doctors. tell them that go and do this. For what now? What okay. is what is the therapy, therapy could be behind that? And, I think it's then, and then you, 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 again, you know that to us in this part of the world, we are entrenched in our native thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. We can't just, you we know. We can't take it out take of it us. Out. It's going to take a lot of, you know, native and spiritual brain thinking. remodeling to take it. And then you can't take it off them. So, uh, to them, they see it as foreign. But most of these medicines have been discovered. Even the modern medicine started in Africa. Our apologies. Yes. We have Paul from Abia State calling in. Paul, many thanks for calling. What's your contribution on the topic at hand? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm. Yes, I want to say that uh, the malaria vaccine, can our health center produce it in Nigeria here? That's the question I want to ask you this in the studio there. Paul, it takes a lot of research. Can any of our health center produce malaria vaccine in our hospitals here? Can any of our health centers produce? It's not produced at health centers. It's produced at the pharmaceutical level. Oh, we understand what And GSK, then, that's what I'm trying to. GSK has a Nigeria uh, branch, OK? If they don't have the requisite um, environment or equipment to produce in Nigeria, they can produce and find a way to bring, bring it, it in. in here. And then they, 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 they are the um, custodian of the vaccines, which is then distributed along. And um, what is, as far as some key health issues are concerned, the body is becoming fluid and broken down in a way, okay. um, putting them in silos that if it's not from Nigeria, if it's not from here. Because even you look at the, at the COVID-19 um, vaccines, vaccine. yeah. the Nigeria was there as the guy that finished from Calabar, was there as part of the team. So the body is breaking down. So it, as far as health is concerned, the body is fluid. That's why it's easy for a doctor to move to Saudi Arabia, okay. to move to this place and still treat people. So don't let us look at it from the If it's not produced from us, then it can't okay, be. Like the question that um, the caller also asked is, is packed, is packed me up to ask that when these vaccines come to Nigeria eventually, are we sure that it's not going to be hoarded or it's not going to be too expensive for people to afford? Yeah, there, there's funds to take care of that. And then we have enough experience in vaccine distribution. In Nigeria, we have enough experience. Looking at the experience, so what yes, we suffered from yes. COVID nineteen and the, no, the um, COVID, expense. The, the COVID is, it becomes a, a expense because everybody, everybody was involved in COVID vaccination, the politics of COVID, you know, the also um, challenges of COVID. But this is targeting particular population, which is not necessarily everybody. Okay, doctor. So, yeah. and then part of the national program of immunization, you can deploy it. Doctor, let me ask, um, we've seen um, some controversies stemming from the vaccine and manufacturing of vaccines for COVID-19. And we've also seen the diversification in the acceptance in terms of brands. Some people would preference for brand. Some people prefer this brand over that brand. In the composition for the malaria vaccine that's just been announced by the WHO, can you highlight some of the side effects? Because we do understand that, like you stated rightly, hydroquinine uh, and uh, chloroquine. chloroquine had some uh, liver effects. In this one, are there side effects that you could enumerate? Well, again, you know, let's look at the principle how this vaccine works. You know, there are about three stages of the, of the parasite. There's a liver stage. Okay. Uh, there's a blood stage. There's an infection stage. Okay. So what this thing does is that when the parasite enters the human body, it enters the liver to multiply. What the, what the vaccine does is to block that entrance into the liver to get the multiplication that will re-enter the blood. Yeah. Generally, you know, when you give vaccines, you know, all those chills, cold, and all those things, they, it's, 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 because you are raising an immune response to block some. So those, those ones are there. So apart from that, we're looking at general deep um, concerning thing. Not, not, we've, not, we've, not, we've not seen that in more than 2.3 doses given all, of, all over the so world not now. Until that. All right, many thanks. Um, yeah. Dr. Ridotta, are you there? 
Yes, I am there. All right, many thanks for hanging in there. You know, you know, by the time we have the rollout for uh, inoculation, especially let me for those who do not understand that, I mean immunization in Nigeria. You know, what should we expect uh, of the turnout, especially for people uh, for this vaccine, given given that the reaction and the passive response to COVID nineteen vaccine have. Um, I don't know, should I say I've not been very effective? What, what's your take on that? This will be our last question to you, sir. Okay. We shall expect a free flow uh, and each free system um, because we have the experience like you talked the other time. We can use our fat likely we are going to use our routine immunization because we are talking of number five there is a system for them already that should not be a problem what happened during covid is not likely going to happen for the malaria vaccine you see if it was children that covid was affected thank god it's not children parents will not be will not be careless so if it's so anything that concerns children that concerns the minors mothers Parents, they don't joke with it. So it's not likely that there will be any problem with that. Um, the issue is that we should educate people because we don't even have enough. We don't have enough enough data in the public domain. Okay, what are the side effects that happen when the students take it? But generally, WHO told us it's very safe. We need to collect our own data. The parents do not just think my child has taken vaccine. That's the major problem. And then forget about other ways of preventing the breeding of mosquitoes and then other way of present, preventing the malaria. So they have to be careful about that. I'm happy that at least 30%, at least 30% of the children who will not really, really have access to many other interventions or who might have had problem with malaria, severe malaria and die, we are going to save them. But we need to improve because this is not like any other country. Look at where our people sleep. Some people sleep on top of water. They just have a hot, everywhere stagnant water, everywhere. So the, 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 the problem of malaria is not going to go with the vaccine. The vaccine does not even, it's not that effective anyway. But at least it's going to it's going to do something for some people it's going to save some children it's going to save a lot of people and the other thing it's not really going to have effect on the pharmaceutical markets because the people we are targeting for this vaccination are less than five years on the five mainly on less than two years and malaria affect all of us everybody so the the market for anti-malaria is still vast but I think the countries who have achieved the total uh, elimination that they cannot even report a case of malaria in their country and they say they are malaria free, they didn't really take vaccine. So as we are instituting this vaccine, which is important, which is a good solution for us now, we should, right. we should start collecting data and then make sure other methods, other measures we stick to All right. Many, thank th you. many thanks for your submission, Dustman. I must say thank you for creating time to join us via the Zoom line. And of course, thank many you. thanks for you being in the physical, uh, being with us physically in the thank studio. Um, I think uh, we're wrapping up now. And the last trend is, um, the last segment is the last trending stories that caught our attention, that bind us together as one, as family. Uh, I think because we've run out of time, we'll just be able to uh, take just uh, one trending story. And that is um, the Lagos State panel of inquiry uh, confirmed NSAS protesters who were killed at the Lekki toll gate on the 20th of October 2020 and after submitting their report to the gov to Governor Somolu a uh, few, uh, let me say last week or a few days ago and we've seen what has been happening on social media thus far. Let me come to you Dr. Tuyo, what's your take on it? Well, um, it, 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 it must have been quite a tough decision for the Governor and for the state as it is, but um, the kudos first for the man to be that open and straightforward and say, listen, tell me, you, you didn't interfere, tell me what it is. And then the, the report has come. Um, that should to create way for healing, you know, and then understanding where we went wrong and who are those, those ones that are involved. 
and create way to heal. I, I hope you can sincerely heal and then learn and never to allow this thing to happen again. All right, many thanks for that. Um, Dr. Onufela, let me come to you, sir. What's your take on um, the NSAT report. Um, report that was submitted to Governor Sawolu? I think if it's unwell, any process can start. People who are, who are really in the wrong, we should learn to apologize and take responsibility. Mm. So if things are handled properly, I think we may be on the right on the right path. Now there is a report. Healing is possible. The healing process can begin immediately. And we should not do it in a way that we start going to reverse. You know, we should do things the right way and apologize when necessary and compensate people appropriately. You can't compensate for life lost, but people should be seen that justice has been done, and then people who are, are in a way indicted, you know, there is, there, is, there is a way that government makes sure that such a thing will not occur again. So I think healing is possible. All right, many thanks for that. I think for me, let me start from the panel. You know, the panel was led by Justice Doris uh, with... Uh, my second dad who was also involved, that is retired DIG Sai Wolakan, who was also part of the panel of uh, it was also part of the panelists as well. And I feel that the pam the panel um, has uh, committed nothing nothing but the truth when it comes to transparency and I think I say kudos to them. For Lagos State Government, I also think that they des they deserve some uh, commendation as well based on the approach uh, that they've um, followed through to the end of uh, this um, uh, this NSAS thing because I believe that other states have not followed through. I believe that other states have not shown that uh, they uphold the business of protection when it comes to lives and properties of the states. Um, also, I think that I also want to use this opportunity to also say that um, I saw some videos, I think, um, that, that transpired online, I think about 24 or 48 hours uh, um, ago, where uh, um, His Excellency San Fashola who said that he did not see, he doesn't know the whereabouts of the camera. You know, in my head, I just say, can you imagine that? As in, really? But I just want to post that, that can you imagine that? And there's a reason why I'm posting. And, and I think that um, another takeaway for me is the fact that 48 victims, gosh, this is painful. This is an embarrassment to justice. Yeah, and I feel that police brutality is still ongoing. Lives, are, lives have continued to be, uh, have, have continued to, uh, to be lost, you know. And the hopes of the people have been destroyed. The future of some children, the pa their partners, their families, you know, cannot be the same again, whether we like it or not. As far as I'm concerned, some of us you know, may, may never find, you know, healing, regardless of certain things that passes across us or we all if life have gone through no, gone through us regardless of where we are in our lives even if even though you're happy or you're in a good place and i think the last thing i want to touch on is the fact that a lot of people have vindicated dj switch have vindicated um, cnn have vindicated even arise tv because i know that they were sued and i think that for most people most people didn't know this except people that i work closely with i was also fined on air for one of my episodes uh, where I spoke heavily on uh, NSAS um, last year and I was sanctioned. Um, and I think that the fact that the, our top leaders, you know, can actually lie to us, you know, lie to its people. It's, I just feel that it's very terrible. It's very disloyal behavior. And I, I hope that we can all learn from this. And obviously, you know, like uh, my uh, Dr. Lou Fela said, an apology is necessary, is needed needed swiftly even knowing that it is not uh, it's not going to restore so lost i believe that uh, um i know that my co-host one of my co does not agree with me don't worry you have your turn i, I agree that uh, <laughs> that uh, the youth the youth are unhappy, are unhappy presently and they need an apology fast and i, I and i and really I, I think that they really need an apology and the government must seriously work on you know connecting the people you know in a way that the youth can find solace in a way that they can have some inclusion you know in the governance that is being run today in our country and i think that that's also part of the challenges we are fa facing that was what actually better answers yes, you know and that must be looked into uh, looked into fast or swiftly uh, i think quickly let me allow dami to take a swipe in one minute because I'm, uh, i've been I told that we are the only person that deserves the accolade now on this table from my end is the panel who 
judiciously did their job without bias. And if we look at the list that were released, we still had, um, uh, we still saw this uh, app uh, appellation of missing, presumed dead. Now, there are some people that have not been found. But to the panelists, to the inquiry team, I say thank you to you for not letting us doubt our sanity. Mm. Because at some point, it felt that the people that were on the field at that day, were they lying? Were they seeing something else? But now, going back to apologies, I do not think it's apology time. When they should have rendered that apology was on the 21st of October 2020. It should have been an apologetic time. This time is for us to know, okay, who ordered that shooting? It's not like we are going to have anything to do or anybody in court will be brought to justice the way most cases have been swept under the carpet. But for this true healing and sanity, we need to know, we demand accountability for who? Or that the shooting. And we will get that accountability. With that, we've come to the end of another episode of Real Talk with Kika. And indeed, I've had an awesome time on the show with Dr. Tui <laughs> joining us physically. And of course, with Dr. Olufela Ori Doctor. I hope I, I know I'm not pronouncing that properly, but apologies, yes. you know. <laughs> many times so for he wants to find, find out. Find out whether uh, he knows. Um, to the daughter. I, I can hear us. I'm very sure you can hear that. I would, I would message you after the show, but of course, yeah, I'm always glad to have people like you who have wealth of uh, experts when it comes to the field of medicine. And I pray that uh, may God continue to bless the work of your hands with your contribution to the culture of our country. On that note, I said, please keep being real. And regardless of what life throws at you, please keep at it. I'll be real. Bye now. Kike. Oh, gosh. Thank God.